Well, good morning, Southern Oregon, and welcome back to The Real Estate Show. I'm Alice Lima. I'm a broker here in beautiful Southern Oregon with John L. Scott Real Estate. So happy to have you join me again for another edition of The Real Estate Show. Today, we're going to be talking to the founder and president of the Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op, Mark Taylor. We like to have him on uh, every so often to bring us updates and bring us up to speed about what's going on in the local hemp industry. And you know, there's been a lot of a lot of changes with the laws. There's been some some run-ins with uh, the different county agencies. We have water going on, and you know, farming in general is not always the easiest in Denver. But uh, Mark's in the thick of it, and he's going to kind of bring us up to speed about everything hemp that's going on in Southern Oregon. And also noteworthy, Southern Oregon hemp is award-winning, and there's also a lot of medical benefits that come from that. Uh, hemp product, the CBD oil, and there's there's new new things going on with the science of all that. So Mark Taylor, Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op, will be joining us today. And cannot wait to hear all that he uh, wants to bring us up to speed on. Uh, speaking of bringing up to speed, the local housing market is still chugging along, but it's been it's been kind of a bumpy week. Uh, the world events are starting to weigh heavy. Um, on uh, the economy is definitely overseas. There's nervousness over here. Uh, and then in Southern Oregon, we still have people that need to move. But with all of this going on, it is starting to affect the local market. The interest rates are definitely up. There may be more interest rates between now and June. We'll have to see. I know the feds make the predictions and sometimes they follow through and sometimes they don't. But there's enough changes going on right now that they're starting to readjust the predictions for spring and summer housing markets in 2022. Now, what that means is over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about what might be different because if the prices start going up again, we need to change our strategy, whether we're buying or selling. If the inventory, the supply of houses continues to go up, we need to change our strategy, whether we're buying or selling. So we want to keep an eye on all those reports. We'll be bringing them to you every week. It's why we have a weekly show here in Southern Oregon, uh, so that you can be good consumers and fully informed. So with that said, we do need to take a quick break before we start our interview with Mark Taylor of Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op. We're brought to you by John L. Scott, Ashland and Medford. We're brought to you also by Guy Giles of Mutual of Omaha Mortgage and our local real estate association, the Rogue Valley Association of Realtors. Thank you so much, everybody, for sponsoring us. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to The Real Estate Show, everybody. I'm Alice Lima, broker John L. Scott, uh, here in beautiful Southern Oregon, and so excited to get to get caught up with Mark Taylor of the Southern Oregon Hemp Cooperative. Welcome back, Mark. We haven't talked to you in forever. How are you doing? Doing real well, Alice, and uh, as always, I really appreciate being on your show. Well, you always, uh, you know, you've got your finger on the pulse of all things hemp here locally. So um, why don't you uh, just, I mean, we haven't been able to really chat since uh, COVID, I think. Yeah, I um, think so. how, how did things uh, work out for you and the other farmers with that? Oh, they were, uh, I think they were demented. It was a, a challenge. I don't think any business escaped uh, the dregs of, uh, of COVID. And uh, you know when the, we're we're part of the market, uh, agricultural market. And I don't care if it's trucking, supply uh, chain issues. Um, it was just really um, you know re the market retracted, and, and on top of all the other things that hemp farmers face, from legislative issues to the weather to uh, the general challenges that we went through with COVID, and we're still not quite out of COVID. You know, there's a there's some positive um, uh, indications on the horizon, but uh, I really feel for our farmers and. Uh, I guess that's why I'm uh, kind of the one of the members here of the co-op. I hope I can help. Yeah, yeah. Well, you are super active um, with all those folks. So now that we're like sort of have COVID behind us, or at least we learned how to deal with it, um, a lot of the marketing has changed and the world is certainly different. I don't even know where to start except um, how how are the farms going? Uh, well, can I answer that question and maybe kind of a long, cut me off? Yeah, absolutely. This is your time. Go for it. 
but let me get you kind of an update on what I believe of where we're at in the hemp market today Perfect. in the Rogue Valley, at least in Oregon. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, several large issues that I think the uh, government, our local government, and the administrative authority code enforcement would, um, I don't know if they'd appreciate it because I have a uh, kind of a negative view of our government and how they have attacked the hemp farmers and those that lease their land, especially the elderly. So with that being said, we've really, uh, have heard a number of farmers, and I say we, uh, I, I, in the past, I've never had, I'm a builder, as you know, Alice, and uh, consequently, I've never had any problem with code enforcement, but uh, our farmers, especially those that lease the land or rent to a uh, another farm, maybe that farm isn't uh, totally above board, that person isn't, and uh, I, I, I'd like to use your format to warn uh, those uh, that, uh, would like to lease or rent their property out to be very beware, be very aware of the huge punitive penalties that uh, government is opposing. And I, in no way, I, I think it should be education first. And I'm, I gotta say, I know there's many, many good uh, people that work in the bureaus at our local uh, governments and they mean well, but uh, this heavy handedness uh, where they've got the state police coming out. Many of the people, Alice, that lease uh, their farms are elderly people. Uh, by uh, just the um, the basis that they own their they own their land and uh, they've retired now, but they're looking for an, an income. And what happens, especially if we look at the cartels, and there are a number of cartels operating here apparently in the valley, and I think that's been proven. They send a person that's very polished to an elderly person, a uh, straw man, I guess you could say, and that person does have a, a substantial amount of money in relation to what you could rent the property for, for hay or cattle. And elder people say, gosh, you know, a gift to help supplement my retirement that is down. And I know of two particular farms that have a really um, a horrible fines uh, laid upon them. And this is kind of what I'm forming my viewpoints uh, upon. And so the person takes that money and they are, and, and the two cases, they're at least 77 to 80 years old. One's a single lady that owns some, Ash, some property in Ashland, the other one owns some property in the uh, Eagle Point area. And the next thing you know, code enforcement showed up and one of the farms got levied a $300,000 fine. Uh, these people were going through health problems. So they, of course they needed the money. One, the wife had cancer. I know that she was a survivor, thank goodness. And the other, uh, and the husband went through a heart operation, major four, four bypass during the leasing where these far other these people were leasing the property. My point is to government, these folks had no way to review what the farmer was doing as far as electrical code and as far as building code, Alice. And so it was a gotcha moment for them because I don't I don't resent anybody that arrives at 80 years old and has a beautiful home. I think this was a 90 acre uh, ranch. And I believe that the government is going after certain people that have the means, they believe have the means to pay those kind of exorbitant fines. And so if that if that message resonates uh, with any of your viewers, and I hope it does, if you're considering uh, renting your property, leasing your land to a potential uh, you know, sub uh, farmer who wants to uh, utilize your, your fine property here in the Rogue Valley, be aware. So I don't know if you have any comments on that or if you've heard of what's happening uh, to you know some people, they get caught uh, literally uh, not knowing, you know, it, it, it is ignorance. You, you should become uh, more informed as a landowner, but the government, if you, you live here in the Rogue Valley, Alice, I've asked uh, the, both the DEQ when it comes to how to dispose of the camp if it goes hot. This was a couple of years ago, but I've reached out to government and, uh, and I'm just wondering why they couldn't do PSAs and work with local people. These are people that are not criminals, Alice. These are people that just own some property and want some extra income and don't know the laws. And um, and there is some confusion out there because uh, even law enforcement will make that statement that they can't tell the difference between hemp and marijuana. So you can imagine an 80 year old person going through health problems. How are, how are they going to know what a farmer, and, and these are large ranches. So they're sometimes a half a mile, a quarter mile away. They can't buy their scooter chair down there and monitor all this. And by the way, both of these parties use professionals, attorneys to write up contract agreements. And so, oh dear, yeah, it wasn't like they were trying to, um, you know, circumvent any of the laws. So 
It's already happened to those folks. I don't know how it will work out, but I really appreciate your format to tell other folks, uh, don't endure this kind of pain. Be very aware and, uh, and uh, either be able to, almost, I can say this, either be able to go down and monitor and know a little bit about code, which is, I'm a builder, and sometimes code enforcement on structures will take an hour, hour and a half to look at everything. So I can't imagine how the elderly are going to get educated to understand what all the codes are. It can be done. I'm not saying that, but I sure would appreciate it if uh, code enforcement would reach out to organizations such as the Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op, the OIHFA, which is the Oregon Industrial Hemp Farmers Association, and um, and we, we would gladly hold meetings so they could share this information with our uh, local community and those who would appreciate legal operators and, uh, and not get hit, thus maybe not get hit with such exorbitant fines that they can't afford. Well, and that's kind of the, the problem is we do have uh, good people operating correctly and uh, you know everybody's kind of getting caught in the same net. Um, so yes. the, um, the, the raids, if you will, and the code enforcement, are they going after hemp people or cannabis? Well, they're going after hemp people initially, and um, and there lies the problem. Um, those that are leasing their their now remember we are the Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op, so all I'm aware of is uh, is hemp farms, and we do not have any marijuana members. Uh, but you in, in our past um, podcast that we've done, uh, we spoke about some of the confusion between the Delta Nine, the limit that it defines hemp and what then breaches over and is called marijuana, the cousin plant of the hemp plant. And uh, sometimes, uh, I think once again, as you know, Alice, we uh, as good professional farmers uh, get a seed strain and it goes hot and it becomes marijuana. And, and the government is already, the ODA is already really harsh, even within that limit. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty much that you, um, you know, have to dispose of it it's not usable, and thus a farmer loses um, loses maybe half of his crop because some seed strains will go hot. The what what the uh, the the local code enforcement and ODA in Jackson and Josephine County they're saying this problem is really severe, probably because we're close to the California border. And when I say severe, I'm talking about malcontents, those that want to operate illegally, coming up. And I hope this answers your question coming up and making a presentation to whoever owns their farm, but many times they are elderly people and uh, say, hey, we'll offer you this much money, which sounds great to the landowner. And they take it and their intent all along, more than likely, is to breach over and grow marijuana, although they're telling the, they're telling the, um, the landowner that they're growing hemp. And oh dear. That's a really a tough, because, because like uh, this one gentleman, he wouldn't know, uh, you know, a pie, a pine cone from a tricone, and uh, <laughs> consequently, they that's not their business. They just and a lot of elderly people are trusting. That's why yes. there's elder, that's mm -hmm. why there's elder abuse laws when it comes to renting to them, writing contracts with them. And I wish code enforcement would understand that. And by the way, folks, code enforcement is so strong that they have totally eliminated strong in their in their enforcement that they've eliminated your ability to go to a jury trial. You're not entitled to that under code enforcement. So they have the, and they do, they have the uh, judge just a few doors down. They, uh, they reference the fine. You will more than likely pay that fine. I don't know anybody or any way to get out of it. So that's too heavy handed. I did not know in Oregon that code enforcement really could, uh, could uh, bypass that constitutional right of a, a trial by jury because, uh, that is uh, one of our great freedoms, but, uh, and especially when the fines are so high, it breaches over from just code enforcement. Like generally, if uh, we do something wrong and the building will get a $500 fine, uh, something isn't corrected and, and uh, I've always corrected any problems. I can't imagine a good builder not, but you get my point, $300,000. That's, that's just a little bit like almost taking the person's farm away from them. Those are, egregious fines as far as I'm concerned and not on par with the crime or with the, they don't even call it a crime. They just call it a, a, uh, you know, a code of violation. So anyway, it's been a, it's been scary for, uh, for industry and, and rightfully so it should be because uh, it's, um, it's something that could literally, you could lose your farm if, uh, if you're not careful. 
Well, and I'm wondering if there are, um, you know, when these uh, violations are reviewed, if the fact that the the owners were elderly and maybe um, they were under a misrepresentation situation, if that will play into it at all, and and hopefully things will work out better for them. Yeah, I hope so. The attorneys that were good, uh, notable attorneys, I know both of them, and uh, it really revealed to me that not even the attorneys know what is happening within hemp law, and uh, we're probably a little bit naive on some of the, uh, once again, the bad players that are coming across the border and uh, coming up to our region to try to operate in the world's greatest place in the, in the, in the whole uh, face of the earth to grow hemp, and they understand that, but Sadly enough, uh, when I say hemp, uh, they do uh, plan on breaching our laws. And, uh, and the other thing that code enforcement doesn't do real quickly, Alice, is they don't chase down the perps. Uh, in this case, one of the um, principal law enforcement officers told this one elderly gentleman, the reason we turn the sirens on and, uh, and come in, uh, you know, guns ablaze, and so to speak, is to scare off all of the uh, migrant farmers because that uh, imbues too great of a... Uh, a response, financial responsibility on the county where, of course, if they have COVID or if they have any health problems and just the documentation required if they're illegal to send them back. Oh, uh, my goodness. Well, we've yeah. got a quick break coming up, folks. We're having a really interesting update with Mark Taylor, uh, Southern Oregon Hemp Cooperative. Looks like he's the hemp caster now. And you don't yeah. want to miss another minute. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Well, welcome back to The Real Estate Show, folks. Uh, Alice Lima here, broker John L. Scott, having a super, super informative conversation with Mark Taylor, Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op. And right before the break, uh, Mark, and sorry that we had to like get through that so quickly, but we have sponsors. <laughs> um, yeah. And we were just wrapping up how, um, how hard it is on some of the landowners, especially the elderly ones, that didn't quite understand, you know, kind of the misrepresentation of some of the people that wanted to lease their property. And now they're, now they're in a world of hurt with code enforcement. Yes, and I think I was, uh, we were talking at the break uh, uh, that it's a good idea to reach out to your co-op, Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op. I sure can help now armed with the knowledge of what's happened this past year and some of the hurt that I've seen firsthand. I'm, I'm, I'm very clear to not offer legal advice, but to uh, make sure I cover the points that uh, I think that people want to hear and how to, how to underwrite a lease safely and, uh, and properly and, uh, and give, them it, uh, give them direction to maybe go to the Oregon Industrial Hemp Farmers Association because uh, Courtney is an attorney as, and as well as Greenlight Law Group. So oh, by all ahead. means, yeah, by all means, I want to direct people to the, uh, to the right folks that can uh, avoid having them experience the same thing that a couple of our, our local farmers uh, experienced. It was extreme fines as we were talking in the previous segment and really some really some heartache and, uh, and uh, as I say, really hard to get out of because code enforcement is so, uh, so uh, limiting as to what your options are. You basically have to pay the fine. So, and then we were talking about Senate Bill 1564 that uh, I have a lot of information on because that is the bill that affects uh, new farmers and uh, those that let their license lapse. Uh, Senate Bill 1564 is my understanding passed. Uh, it looks like it'll be Jackson and Josephine County that enforces that provision because uh, for all the edicts I've heard, they believe that uh, we were really um, experiencing a lot of unlawful activity with uh, some of the um, some of the bad players that would come across the uh, the border and approach people and take advantage of them and then convert to marijuana. And so uh, all indications are that Jackson and Josephine County are gonna force the moratorium uh, limits of uh, Senate Bill 1564, which includes for those farmers that uh, are concurrently um, uh, farm because they had last year's license, had a license last year, they have to farm on the same footprint as they farmed last year. And of course, I believe Ooh. that. Is, yeah, I believe that's bad. Uh, I because that's really that's hard on the soil, isn't it? It is. It is. And I, I was uh, reached out to by, of course, there's, there's many uh, farmers that know much more than me. They are the, the hands-on uh, folks. And uh, many of these uh, farmers, even in our valley, and we have a number of members from Northern California and Eastern Oregon, they're fifth and sixth generation farmers out. So they really know that to be true. And they were really quite irate that the ODA, um, you know, didn't consider 
good farming practices and what that means as far as crop rotation and not uh, after two years, I believe it is three years, you're supposed to rotate, move uh, your crop. And, uh, and this actually helps the soil kind of cure and heal. And then you go back again, crop rotation. And so, and, and to that note, kind of a tie-in is that um, the ODA invited, uh, sent out a request for um, professionals and, uh, and farmers to be on the new uh, hemp board here in Oregon. And uh, I, I, for one, was just very disappointed uh, with the ODA. We submitted people like uh, Courtney Moran and Matt Cyrus from uh, Eastern Oregon Hemp Farmers Association, amongst many others. Uh, that I, I probably shouldn't have named those two because they're all equal in, in knowledge and, um, and really have passion for the hemp industry. And out of all those people, I think there was 15 or 20, uh, some of them here with the co-op, only one was chosen. And from my understanding, I'm gonna sound biased, but from my understanding, uh, the rest of the appointees were all bureaucrats, uh, people that, um, that were in government in some form or another. And uh, I, I just think that that's uh, very inefficient. I, I, I know that government did themselves, they'll find it to be true. They did themselves a disfavor because our farmers and our business professionals are for equitable, good, legal growing in the greatest, um, you know, the hip capital of the world, uh, Southern Oregon. And then, and then, then again, why would you have a moratorium on hemp in Oregon? At least some counties are going to enforce that. And then yet have other states, Idaho, as you probably heard, opened up a hemp production <coughs> uh, this past year. So uh, if we have that designation, which we do of the greatest uh, grow hemp environment in the whole world, why would you want to degrade that and limit entrepreneurship and, um, and, and growth of this, uh, you know, very much a commerce sector that we can use in the Rogue Valley. I don't know if people are aware how much money that hemp pumps into this valley, but it's the form of everything from materials to soil, to pipe, to, to rock, to building material, to supporting stores and uh, hardware. So we, uh, we felt like ODA made a brass decision. And the reason real quickly, people ask, well, why the moratorium? It wasn't so much of the, uh, the oversupply because note that our, our farmers pretty much uh, uh, had to handle that brutal uh, fact is that we did oversupply and by, the, by our own ODA numbers, uh, we reduced uh, capacity or growth uh, by about 80%. So we're down 20% in numbers, but the reason that ODA did it was is they want to hire more policemen and more enforcement uh, in the coming years. And now that we're down 80%, I really don't, I really don't see the um, the reasoning behind that because all it'll do is increase costs. You know, fees are going to go up to pay for that. And you know what they're doing is they're driving small business out of the hemp industry. So uh, if it becomes too burdensome to be in that business, then are you saying that it's, it's this, the little guy is going to get kind of elbowed out and it's going to just be kind of the more institutional farmers? Yes, I am. I'm saying that just as clear as I can say it is that uh, if you follow any industry, I don't care if it was tobacco or cotton or even our oil industry at the turn of the century or the auto industry, at the turn of the century, there was most of the most of our burgeoning industries, including farm and agricultural, uh, were controlled by small business. And uh, after so long, primarily the nature of commerce, but uh, large business has the capital. And now they're really uh, the ADMs and the Pfizer's. And, uh, and I found out Nestle is now into it. Oh, is that uh, right? Yeah, yeah. It just came from a pretty reliable source that Nestle is. I don't know if they have farms as of yet, but they're... Uh, putting out uh, information that they're gonna start putting it into their, into their uh, you know, retail products. And that's really gonna be hard. You know what, I, I went on a, a local radio talk show, I gotta add this in, and I talked about the poor farmer that got hit by the fines. I thought they would be 100%, Alice, that our local community would support the, I, I'm not saying that everybody that, that's uh, elderly is naive and don't understand, but uh, I, I can only refer to these two cases. And the calls are actually about 30%, in favor of um, the government, um, more regulation. Um, these hemp farmers are out there destroying our uh, valley and its appearance, these hoop houses, and, uh, and there's some negative that. I'd like to speak to that real quickly, but it was really harsh in so much as um, 
you know, if you look at anything in the Valley, whether it's building, look what happened after the fires, what they've done out there in the Phoenix talent area mm -hmm. and putting those government looking trailers up all the same color, all the uh, talk about devaluing it and hurting the real estate business. I feel uh, no one wants to live next to that. That was just really a fast and furious plan. That's no good. Undoubtedly, uh, since hemp was legalized here in Oregon, uh, there has been a fast and furious um, uh, kind of idiom in this whole growth. And I would agree with uh, more stronger structures on the hoop houses, uh, clean up policy, things that could be addressed with just simple edicts and laws. And, uh, and, and I asked Rogue Valley residents to give us some time. This is kind of the third year of, uh, of growth in the hemp. I guess it's going on the fourth year. And right now, the good news is the farmers, many, many uh, mom pop farmers to overcome uh, the overcapacity, the water, the poor water year, the legislative issues. We have moved into making some of the finest products, oils, creams, doggy treats, uh, hair care products. If, if the Valley residents would realize the, we as small businesses could turn into job producers and make something that has efficacy for the body helpful if in other words, the hemp farmer doesn't do everything right. We don't do everything right, but we mean to. We are lovers of the land. Uh, we've made some mistakes, but I think through, once again, the Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op and having community meetings, we, we would like to get better. But of all things, we've got the government on our backs the way it is. We need the support of the community. And, and with the support of the community, we will turn this into family wage jobs and uh, and produce some really fine retail oils and products that the CBD uh, from the hemp plant uh, can can help us help us in our health too. Well, and it's very uh, mainstream now. It's it's in the local drugstores, the creams and uh, mm -hmm. the salves. Uh, people are giving it to their pets. Uh, people are using it. Uh, the blood pressure glaucoma thing. So um, it very quickly was adopted by mainstream and is so commonplace now um you know I, I guess it's a little surprising that the industry is still you know getting um getting kind of beat up <laughs> so to speak oh uh, be, yeah be. we're really getting beat up not just oversupply but it was a bad water year as you know and then oh then there was that yeah horrible water year and we still have the mites and the little all the little things that the farmers have to fight from nature and then now more legislation again. Do you, do you know, uh, folks, if you want to establish an industry, if you don't like our industry, then we're not going to make it because we're already fighting. And I'm talking directly to the Rogue Valley residents. Um, but once again, if you'll just give us a foothold, who do you want to buy your products from? Do you always want to go to Walmart and buy your products? That's up to you. But uh, I'd love to see small farms uh, be able to help with their mortgage payments or uh, their expenses and be able to develop a little retail online stores for this fine, fine uh, CBD oils that has been proven to be so helpful to our bodies. You you heard what Oregon State uh, University study came out with the fact that uh, now uh, CBD and CBG, specifically the A uh, element of our plant, has to, been deemed to be a COVID blocker. Did you oh, hear that news? No, I did not. That's incredible. Yeah. That's from Oregon State University. So naturally, we want some help from the uh, FDA to be able to list that on our packaging, that it is a immune support system for COVID. And it, this was a PhD study. So that, that's really going to help many of our farmers that produce the CBGA and the CBDA uh, elements of the plant. Wow. So how is that effort going with the FDA? Well, that was a that was a prior bill, the Senate Bill 1564. I think that was uh, statutes within the ODA and the packaging and the mixing and the formulations did not come out to the farm, to the farmer's um, favor. And I say this once again with that bent in mind uh, that uh, large corporations can underwrite anything with labeling. They've got attorneys. Uh, they know how to do it to, uh, to protect themselves. And I understand, as you do, Alice, that there has to be rules and regulations to how you represent your product. But once again, I can just tell you that our farmers and our farmers that are making retail products, they're not into doing it wrong. They would just like a little bit of help, maybe an advisory board within the ODA. So in the FDA. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, because we have, we've got programs for small business administration. I wish they would uh, open up, the ag departments would open up uh, helpful um, 
helpful uh, programs to support our small business farmers. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. We've got to take a quick break uh, for a word from our sponsors. We're talking to Mark Taylor, uh, Southern Oregon Hemp Cooperative, also known as the Hemp Caster. Uh, lots and lots of new things happening in the hemp world. We'll be back in a quick minute. We're brought to you by um, John, uh, John L. Scott, Southern Oregon, uh, Guy Giles, Mutual of Omaha Mortgage, and our local Rogue Valley Association of Realtors. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to the Real Estate Show, folks. Alice Lima here, broker John L. Scott. And what a great, great conversation we're having today. Uh, learning so much from Mark Taylor, Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op. And uh, right before the break, we were kind of talking about some of the benefits and how mainstream the, uh, the uh, hemp products are and also how great Southern Oregon is for an environment to be growing that. So much so you have a local... Is it a contest, a competition? I, I, I like it? to call it a, uh, a hemp business promotion. Uh, it is all things hemp. And we expanded it this year to include the Golden Grow Award. This is the third annual. This was the third annual. Time flies. It was uh, just a month ago in February we had it. And it was just a great show with great energy and, and environment. There was about 77 participants and, and, and folks that showed up. So we had a great crowd. Uh, Got to give... Uh, Kudos to the Ashland Hills and they did a wonderful job and uh, feeding us and uh, supporting the event. And yeah, it's just a beautiful venue over there at the Ashland Hills Inn. And uh, we really enjoyed it. And we expanded it this year to include the Hemp Trade Show. Oh, awesome. In. Yeah, we tied in with some great people there to prosper the products that, uh, as we mentioned in the last segment, I'm really an, impressed what literally what Ma and Pa farmer, retailer, product makers can do. They uh, they get together, they find a good bottle and a pump bottle or a pour bottle, they label it beautifully and uh, they turn into the complete business person, uh, so to speak. Uh, in other words, they, they have it in their field, they grow the best because it's grown right here in Southern Oregon. And then they transition that into a product that you'll see on your shelf at the Ashland uh, food co-op or wherever they are on their online uh, web page and a store. And so I'm just really impressed. We had about uh, 12 exhibitors, 12 or 13 exhibitors, everything from. Oh, that's a good amount. Yeah, it was uh, 12 tables and uh, people, I think a lot of people really came because they wanted to see what our, our farmers are making. It was really well received. We had some of the top speakers, uh, Alice, I, uh, I forgot to invite you. I wish uh, I wish you could have came because uh, I know you uh, care about any kind of commerce and industry in the valley here. And uh, just yeah, we had to, from CPA firms to legal firms to top uh, pharmaceutical um, those that grow and have a background in pharmaceutical. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I, I was just really impressed uh, with the, with all the folks that were presenters and uh, and speakers. And also, here's the exciting news. Although it bears kind of a sad background story, um, Sarah Wood was a young, beautiful lady that lived here in our valley. And uh, sadly enough, um, she contacted brain cancer. At uh, hope I pronounce it right. That glioblastoma, and. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah, it was really uh, quite a touching story, and I, I hope in the short time that I have it, I can I can give her her due. Uh, Sarah contacted it, I believe, at 17 years old. Her father, Eric Wood, uh, got involved, of course, as any father would, and and he started looking for, after seeing what conventional medicine uh, was uh, was doing, it was not helping her, and uh, by all means, I realize everybody has a choice to make when they're faced with that life and, and death uh, type of a prognosis. But uh, he said it was like an intervention, it was very spiritual, that he kept running into people that said, try CBD. And uh, I wish Eric, uh, you know, was, co was on here with me. So, because he tells a passionate story on, uh, on he tried it, you know. And, um, and even though the ultimate, was, the ultimate um, end of the story was not what we wanted that for her to live on, uh, even by Dornbrecher's, and I want to make sure this quote is accurate, uh, the medical uh, professionals at Dornbrecher said that she is their miracle child because she went on to live five years and initially they gave her a 13-month uh, prognosis with the severity of her disease. And now her father is such an advocate for CBD that just this year and at the third annual Golden Grow, we now have the Sarah Wood Memorial uh, award for those that are the strongest advocates for hemp throughout the year. Wow. And, and so uh, I'd like to 
you know, revisit your show again and I'll show you the trophy and the beautiful picture of Sarah. So she'll live on uh, in infinitum uh, as a, uh, as that award will never go away as long as there's hemp planted on this uh, planet. And so uh, that's some of the excitement, not excitement, but that's, that's a good that comes out of good people getting together and of course, honoring those that are that are advocates, but uh, also uplifting uh, the family that knows that their daughter's memory will go on forever as a Sarah Ward Memorial Award. Oh, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Yeah. Great story. Um, and I, I invite anybody to go on to go on to the Southern Oregon Hip Co-op webpage and uh, you can see uh, more of the story and, uh, and then get a review of the third annual Golden Grow and the Hemp Trade Show. And uh, maybe next year we'll we'll really pack it and get more people. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. So um, are there awards also given to farmers and different kinds of hemp? Oh yes, and I almost bet you asked that question. Uh, we judge on four uh, different categories uh, in, uh, in judging our farmers and the fine uh, hemp that they produce. Uh, we judge on terpenes, we've got judges choice, uh, we've got uh, CBD, we've got top uh, Northwest farmer, and I'm sorry, there's one other overall appeal or something like that, but uh, a, a gentleman uh, from Horn Creek Farm, I got to mention his name, he has won the Northwest top farmer uh, two years in a row. Wow. Uh, Paul Murdoch, uh, a well-known business person in our valley, and again, another person that uh, that believes in CBD because Paul fell off the reason he got into it. He's he's close to 60 years old. He fell off his roof. Um, he was a, a builder and he fell off a roof and broke his ankles really bad and got arthritis in both ankles and he had no relief whatsoever. And he'll tell you it is only the CBD oil that um, that helps him with his extreme pain and his uh, bones and his ankles and his feet. Wow, that's remarkable. Yeah, I have a lot of stories like that. And uh, it's why I'm so passionate. I think you know my background. I, I'm not a, uh, I grew hemp for two years and I don't have a green thumb. Apparently it didn't work out that well for me. I seen another way to help and prosper this beautiful plant. So I uh, helped found Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op. But um, I really, uh, I really do hear uh, great stories of uh, helpful benefits of this hemp plant, the CBD and the CBGA. And remember, we're just on the cusp of it. We've really only been growing as a um, as an educated group for about four to five years. 2017, the uh, USDA passed the hemp farm bill. And uh, so we have, with, with technology and young people, I'm trying to program, uh, hopefully someday get into the high schools and the junior colleges. And, uh, and really, uh, hopefully they'll get excited about about hemp, it's a legal uh, product. I wish our educational facilities would realize what it what it can do to prosper young people and give them a, a possible uh, little revenue and and the experience of being a farmer. And so uh, I hope that we can make some inroads there with our educational institutions. Well, and I think that's happening. I think the younger people are super excited and and they receive the benefits and the idea of uh, local hemp products, you know, more readily than. Some of us older people did. <laughs> no, that's right. And I have to add, I got a call from a, a high school student uh, with the FFA, and he was asking questions, which I just welcome on uh, hemp uh, being a uh, type of a bedding material that they could encapsulate in a uh, in a blanket and put hemp in it for their llamas. Uh, this, uh, oh, that's a great work. idea. Yeah, I thought so. And so, yeah, that is starting. It's starting right now. And so I'm just going to keep asking our community to bear with us. And and by all means, if you uh, see something out there in the community that bothers you in regards to a hemp farm or ranch, you're welcome to reach out to the Southern Oregon Hemp Co-op. And and hopefully I can uh, mitigate or, or explain to you um, uh, the condition to, you know, make the aesthetics and make the visual of our valley. It, it truly is a beautiful valley. And, and it's a uh, great thing that you're doing with the Southern Oregon a hemp co-op we're just about out of time and yes absolutely mark taylor we want to have you back for another update on what's going on mr thank hemp you. caster <laughs> thank you so much the thank show you. will be rebroadcast tomorrow at six o'clock have a beautiful weekend we'll catch you next time folks bye now thank you